personal attraction for first impressions to close relationships. This is a fun chapter, kind of, I guess. Well, let's get into it and we'll see how much fun it is. Love. Because humans tend to be fairly defenseless alone, we have evolved as gregarious beings. Due to this need, relationships have become the core of human existence. When people lack a need for relationships, they are diagnosed with the odd personality disorders, paranoid personality disorder, schizoid personality disorder, and schizotypal personality disorder. Since humans, as all other animals, must reproduce to survive, attraction between males and females has, to ha has had to have taken place, or none of us would be here. Humans have an intense need to belong, the need to connect with others in enduring close relationships. Roy Baumeister and Mark Leary feel that the following aspects illustrate the power of social attractions. When a man and woman have a child, the child's survival chances are boosted by a nurturing of bonded parents. Social attachments enhance survival for both children and their caregivers. When separated, they seek to be reunited. People so strongly desire close relationships that they spend billions of dollars to attract the opposite sex. And one of the things they do is have plastic surgery. This is, this is uh, Britney Spears when she was on the Mickey Mouse Club. This is what she looks like now. As you can see, she's had a lot of stuff done to her face. One thing that she's had done is her nose has been made narrower, and she's changed the shape of her chin. This is Angelina Jolie, and she has done just about the same thing that, that Brittany did. Now, I could show you uh, any number of, of uh, celebrities, and most of them have had nose jobs done, whether they're male or female, as a matter of fact. Uh, Tom Cruise, as you can see, this is him um, in a movie when he was in his teens. And this is what he looks like now, as you can see. His nose is narrower. Noses actually grow, not shrink. This is Michael Jackson when he was relatively young, 12 or 13 years old. Here he is um, when he had his, um, what do they call that hairstyle? I can't remember. Anyway, here's, uh, he had, of course, he suffered from vitiligo, and that's one of the reasons why he had his skin lightened, uh, to hide his vitiligo. Uh, but as you can see, he also had his nose done, as did uh, his sisters, interestingly enough. <clears throat> Uh, one determinant of, uh, of interpersonal attraction, and like I said, you can take just about any male or female act, uh, actor, and um, they probably have had some kind of plastic surgery done. Uh, most of them have had uh, nose jobs done for one reason or another, maybe because their nose is too large. Marilyn Monroe famously had her nose done, and then she became the sex symbol of the 1950s and 1960s. But uh, it's very difficult to find any celebrity that hasn't had uh, some work done. Um, uh, who am I thinking of? Uh, Scarlett Johansson? Um, well, just anybody. One determinant of, determinant of interpersonal attraction is proximity sometimes also called propinquity. Propinquity effect is the finding that, that uh, the more we see and uh, interact with people, the more likely they are to become our friends. And this is known as the propinquity effect. Uh, so being close to people makes you friendly with them. Festinger, Schachter, and Bach in uh, 1950 back, uh, tracked friendship formation among the couples in various apartment buildings. Residents had been assigned to their apartments at random. Most were strangers when they moved in. The researchers asked the residents to name their three closest friends in the entire housing project. Just as the propinquity effect would predict, 65% of the friends mentioned lived in the same building, even though the other buildings were not far away.
Mere exposure effect, the finding that uh, the more exposure we have to a stimulus, the more apt we are to, to like it. The propinquity effect occurs due to mere exposure. When we see certain people a lot, and the more familiar they become, the more friendship blooms. Propinquity increases familiarity, which leads to liking, but something more is needed to fuel a growing friendship or a romantic relationship. Otherwise, every pair of roommates would be best friends. That fuel is similarity, a match between our interests, attitudes, values, background, or personality, and those of another person. Now, when we say similarity, we're, we're, not, we're not talking about, uh, it doesn't have anything to do with race, doesn't have anything to do uh, with uh, ethnicity. It has to do with the fact that it's, it's what you like. It's who you are. It's your personality. But folkism also uh, has another saying, opposites attract, the concept complementarity, or that we are attracted to people who are our opposites. And as we have, will discover or have discovered, if we look at groups of, uh, of couples and uh, we claim that they are their opposites, the reality is that their interests, attitudes, values, background, uh, and personality usually are fairly similar. So they're really not opposites. They're only opposites superficially. Birds of a feather flock together. Similarity. What about opposites attract? Complementarity. Research evidence proves that it is overwhelmingly similarity that not uh, and not complementarity that draws people together. We were, uh, we went out to my wife and I went out to lunch the other day, uh, and we were sitting there, and there was a couple. Um, uh, at the next table, they had exactly the same color hair, exactly the same color hair. And we were thinking, well, maybe they dyed their hair. And as it turns out, no, they didn't. They actually have exactly the same color hair. It was uh, brown with uh, blonde highlights on the ends. It was really weird. Similar personality characteristics promote liking and attraction. For example, in the study of gay men's relationships, men sought men with similar personalities. Those who scored high on a test of stereotypical male traits desired a partner who was most of all logical, a stereotypical masculine trait. Gay men who scored high on a test of stereotypical female traits desired a partner who was most of all expressive, a stereotypical femi uh, feminine trait. And this was st a study done by Boyd and Carroll and Meyer in 1984. Similar personality characteristics are important for heterosexual couples and for friends as well. And of course, there were two studies, one done, both done in 1995, all being Costner and Martin and Anderson. Situations you choose to be in expose you to others with similar interests. Then when you discover and create new similarities, they fuel the friendships. Close friendships are often made in college, in part because of prolonged propinquity. We seek physical proximity to those similar in appearance. We seek others with similar degree of physical attractiveness. Without even realizing it, you are often drawn to those who look like you, uh, to the point where people are even more likely to ask out on dates others who are similar to them in terms of attractiveness level. And these are people <clears throat> who have been drawn to each other, and they are, are couples. For committed relationships, uh, choose a similar partner. Relationships based on differences can be difficult to maintain. Perceived similarity more important than actual similarity. Low level of commitment, fling, choose dissimilar partners. So if it's just a fling uh, and you don't want uh, it to go any farther than uh, uh, maybe a, a, a sexual encounter, then choose somebody that's not very much like you. They probably won't want to be around you anymore anyway. We like people who like us for initial attraction. Reciprocal liking can overcome dissimilarity in attitudes, attentional biases to attractive faces. Liking is so powerful that uh, it can even make up for the absence of similarity. 
In one experiment, when a young woman expressed interest in male research participants, simply by maintaining eye contact, leaning toward them, and listening attentively, the men expressed great liking for her, despite the fact that they knew she disagreed with them on important issues. And this was a study done by Gold, Reichman, and Mo Mosley in 1984. Whether the clues are nonverbal or verbal, perhaps the most crucial determinant of whether we like person A is the extent to which we believe person A likes us. Just how powerful is reciprocal liking? One indicator of just how important physical appearance is in attraction is our nearly chronic tendency to shift visual attention to attractive others in our immediate vicinity. According to recent uh, research, it is powerful enough to neutralize our basic tendency to pay more attention to attractive faces. Reciprocal liking. Physical attractiveness plays an important role in liking. Hatfield and her colleagues randomly matched 752 incoming students at the University of Minnesota for a blind date at a dance during freshman orientation week. Although the students had previously taken a battery of personality and aptitude tests, the researchers paired them up at random. On the night of the dance, the couple spent a few hours together dancing and chatting. The partners then evaluated their date and indicated the strength of their desire to date that person again. Of the many possible characteristics that could have determined whether they liked each other, such as their partner's intelligence, independence, sensitivity, or sincerity, the overriding determinant was physical attractiveness. What's more, there was no great difference between men and women on this score. So the, the myth that uh, women uh, uh, look at men uh, and they don't care about attractiveness, uh, okay, that's not really true. And it's the same, of course, it's the same for, for men. Um, men men uh, are looking for attractiveness just like women are looking for attractiveness. Several studies have found that men and women pay equal attention to the physical attractiveness of others. Other studies have reported that men value attractiveness more than women do. A meta-analysis of many studies found that while both sexes value attractiveness, men value it somewhat more. And that's according to Feingold in 1990. It may be that men are more likely than women to say that physical attractiveness is important to them and a potential friend, date, or mate. But when it comes to actual behavior, the sexes are more similar in their response to the physical attractiveness of others. The finding that we like people who like us suggests that the strategy of playing hard to get can sometimes backfire. Recent research suggests that uh, the strategy tends to decrease how much another person likes you, all the while potentially increasing how much that person wants to be with you. Female faces, what is attractive? High attractiveness ratings are associated with large eyes, small noses, small chins, prominent cheekbones, high eyebrows, large pupils, and big, big smile. <clears throat> So who's the most attractive in this in this picture? Why, it's Miss Universe herself. Right in the middle, she's got the biggest smile. She's got the biggest eyes. She's got the highest cheekbones. Well, no. She have the smallest chin. Pretty close. And there we go. Another group of women with big smiles. Male faces, what is attractive? High attractiveness ratings are associated with large eyes, prominent cheekbones, large chins, and big smiles. Facial attractiveness is perceived similarly across cultures. Symmetry is preferred. Size, shape, and location of the features on one side match the other side of the face. Averaged composite faces are preferred. Uh, lost atypical uh, or uh, asymmetrical variations are not perceived as attractive. And here we have two people that are considered very attractive. One is Halle Berry, and the other is David Beckham, the soccer player. I like this hair. <laughs> I like this hair. 
this is this is the actual picture of David Beckham, and this is uh, either his left or his right, and that's his or that's his left. The two halves put together, either his left. That would be his right. This is his right, and this is his left. Sally Berry, Halle Berry. Oh, wow, there's the original right there. Uh, left looks awfully like a lot like the uh, original, and so does the right. She is very has a very symmetrical face. Across cultures throughout the world, consensus emerges. Perceivers think some faces are just better looking than others. Even infants <coughs> prefer <coughs> prefer <coughs> photographs of attractive faces to unattractive ones, and infants prefer the same photographs adults prefer. Attractive faces for both sexes are those whose features tend to be the arithmetic mean or average for the species and not the extremes. This does not mean a composite average face has all the physical qualities that people cross-culturally agree are highly attractive. Familiarity may be crucial variables for interpersonal attraction. People prefer faces that most resemble their own, a crucial variable that explains interpersonal attraction may be simple familiarity. When research participants rate attractiveness of faces, they prefer faces that most resemble their own. The researchers also computer morphed a picture of each participant's face, without the participant's knowledge, into that of a person of the opposite sex. When they presented this photo to participants, they gave the photo of their opposite sex clone even higher ratings of attractiveness. And this, of course, was done by Little and Parrot in 2002. Benefits of beauty. Beauty has been associated with better health outcomes for infants. In, better health outcomes for infants in hospitals. Isn't that weird? Better earnings, better teaching evaluations, winning elections. And, of course, we have these are... These are two losers. Uh, Romney R Romney won his Senate seat, but uh, he lost the presidential election. That's, uh, what's her name? She was uh, the running mate of uh, uh, McCain. I can't think of her name. Anyway, she was a beauty queen from Alaska, and she didn't. Uh, didn't help him a, a whole lot. She was not the brightest bulb in the bunch. So they both lost. A particularly chilling example, and actually she just lost, uh, I think she just ran for governor. She was governor of Alaska at the time that uh, John McCain picked her as his running mate. And uh, she she ran again. She ran for the Senate, I think, up in Alaska and lost. A particularly chilling example of the unfair benefit of beauty was discovered by Bader and Abdallah in 2001, who rated the facial physical attractiveness and health status of premature infants born in hospitals in Beirut, Lebanon. They found that physical attractiveness significantly predicted the health outcomes comes of those, these infants above and beyond the contribution of factors such as their medical condition. The more attractive the, the infant, the more quickly he or she gained weight, and the shorter his or her stay in the hospital. The reason? Neonatal nurses responded more to the prettier infants and gave them better care. As one of the researchers said, nurses played uh, much longer with the cuter babies, held them longer, and spent longer feeding them. It's really upsetting. What if, they had a, uh, what if you have an ugly kid? Physical beauty affects attributions. The halo effect is a cognitive bias by which we tend to assume that an individual with one positive characteristic also possesses other, even unrelated positive characteristics, like the babies. What is, is beautiful is good uh, is a stereotype. The beautiful are thought to be more sociable, more extroverted, more popular, more sexual, more happy, more assertive. Meta-analysis have revealed that physical attractiveness has the largest effect on both men's and women's attributions when they are judging social competence. It's no coincidence that in children's movies, the hero is traditionally attractive and the villain ugly. 
in addition to finding it pleasing to look at attractive others, we also tend to assume that what is beautiful is good. Highly attractive people do develop good social uh, interaction skills. They report having more satisfying interactions with others. Self-fulfilling prophecy. The beautiful receive a great deal of social attention that helps them develop good social skills. Undoubtedly, this kernel of truth in the stereotype occurs because you probably recognize the self-fulfilling prophecy at work here. The way we treat people affects how they behave and ultimately how they perceive themselves. Can a regular person be made to act like a beautiful one via the self-fulfilling prophecy? Researchers gave college men a packet of information about another research participant, including her photograph. This was in 1977. The photograph was rigged. It was either an attractive woman or an unattractive woman. The men were told that they would have a telephone conversation with this woman. In this experimental condition, only verbal communication, no gestures or facial expressions was used. The experimental purpose of the photograph was to invoke the men's stereotype that what is beautiful is good, that the woman would be more warm, likable, poised, and fun to talk to if she was physically attractive than if she was unattractive. In fact, the photograph the men were given was not a photo of the woman with whom they spoke. Did the men's beliefs create reality? This study was later replicated with the roles switched. Women participants looked at a photograph of an attractive or an unattractive man and then spoke with him on the phone. The men were unaware of the women's uh, beliefs about them, and just as in the original study, the women acted on their prophecy and the unknowingly men, uh, the unknowing men responded accordingly. These data remind us that it is a myth that physical attractiveness affects women's lives more than men's. Three meta-analyses uh, that have examined the effect of attractiveness on behavior and perceptions across hundreds of studies have found no gender differences. Physical attractiveness is as important a factor in men's lives as women's lives. And this is uh, Ashwari Rai. I don't know who he is. She's a Bollywood star. Uh, and has, at one, she ran for Miss World or Miss Universe and uh, from India. And I think she won, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, as you can see, she's got all the attributes, the big eyes, the high cheekbones, the small chin. Evolutionary psychology is the attempt to explain social behavior in terms of genetic factors that evolved over time according to the principles of natural selection. Men and women are attracted to different characteristics in each other that maximize reproductive success. The evolutionary approach to love concludes that reproductive success for the two sexes translates into two very different behavior patterns. Throughout the animal world, males' reproductive success is measured by the quantity of their offspring. They pursue frequent pairings with many females in order to maximize the number of their surviving progeny. In contrast, females' reproductive success lies in successfully raising each of their offspring to maturity. They pair infrequently and only with a careful chosen male because the cost of raising and ensuring the survival of each offspring is so high. And this goes back. This is Bur uh, Burkow in 1989 and Simons in 1979. For women, reproduction is costly in terms of time, energy, and effort. They must endure the discomforts of pregnancy and birth and then care for their infants until maturity. Reproducing, then, is a serious business, so women, the theory goes, must consider carefully when they when and with whom they, re, uh, they reproduce. In comparison, reproduction has few costs for men. And the joke says, tonight was the first step in my natural selection process, James. I'm sorry, but you were not selected. <laughs> oh my goodness, okay. Poor James. Researchers asked more than 9,000 adults in 37 countries desirable marriage partner characteristics. 
women valued more than men ambition, industriousness, and earning capacity. Men valued more than, a, than women attractiveness. Top characteristics for both were the same. Honesty, trustworthiness, pleasant personality. When women are near their ovulation and fertility peak, they have a greater preference for men who exhibit signs of reproductive fitness, symmetrical face, masculine face, muscular physique. <clears throat> now, why in the world would they want to reproduce with, with somebody with a, um, a symmetrical face? Well, if they have a symmetrical face, it means they're more attractive. And why, why would they want to reproduce with somebody with a masculine face? A masculine face means that they have uh, strong reproductive genes. They have strong genes that will allow the, the uh, offspring to uh, survive. And a muscular physique means that they'll be able to provide for, the, uh, for her and her family. If she can keep them around. The evolutionary approach to attraction and love has inspired its share of debate. One could argue that evolutionary advantages to having multiple sexual partners should not be limited to men, but should also apply to women. With multiple partners, females would increase the odds of getting resources for their offspring as well as benefits from genetic diversity. Females could choose an attractive male with good genes with whom to procreate and another male with whom to raise the offspring. It may also be the case that men value physical attractiveness in a, a partner not because of evolved tendencies, but simply because they have been taught by society to value it. They have been conditioned by decades of advertising and media images to value beauty in women and to have a more recreational approach to sex than women do. Research has found that in some situations, women value physical attractiveness just as much as men, specifically when they are considering a potential sexual partner as opposed to a potential marriage partner. Other researchers offer additional arguments that the preference for different qualities in a mate can be explained without resorting to evolutionary principles. Around the world, women typically have less power, status, wealth, and other resources than men do. Therefore, in many societies, women need to rely on men to achieve economic security, and they must consider this characteristic when choosing a husband. How are attraction and social connection affected by modern technology? Twitter, Snapchat, Instagram, Tinder, uh, text, virtual reality, uh, field experiments of 100 real-life interactions, pairs with mobile device rated connectedness, and empathy power are uh, empathy lower than uh, pairs without devices. Great. The social network is ruining our, our evolutionary needs. Don't bother me, can't you see I'm texting? As amazing as the technologies are, mobile devices like smartphones can also impair our feelings of social connectedness to others during the course of face-to-face -face interactions. Propinquity in internet world, not that many degrees of separation because we feel connected to everybody. Similarity, uh, people seek others with similar popularity in online dating sites. So if you're a female with, uh, that is, uh, has a lot of followers, then of course you're looking for a male with a lot of followers. Familiarity, uh, liking decreased after meeting compared to liking based on online profile. Inaccuracy of online information was one of the reasons. Propinquity, physical distance, no longer means what it once did, and the Internet allows us to get to know people half a world away. Les Gavec and Horvitz uh, conducted a study testing degree of separation, measuring the social distance between people. These researchers analyzed an instant messaging network, looking at who sent messages to whom. They found that the average length of a person chain was seven and that 90% of the pairs could be connected in just eight hops. 
Similarity, Taylor and colleagues in 2011 found that high popularity users of the site con contacted other popular users at a rate greater than would be expected by chance, a finding that probably does not surprise anybody. After all, who wouldn't want to reach out to the popular potential mates? Well, the less popular users of the site, that's who. The researchers also found that users lower in popularity con contacted other low popularity users more often. Familiarity in this research, Michael Norton and colleagues in 2007 gave a survey to participants both before and after going on a date. Predate, all the participants knew about their partner, was what they had read on a website profile, so their ratings of how much knowledge they had about their partner increased post-date. But their ratings of how much they liked their partner decreased after the date, as did perceptions of how similar they were. Why? Because the more familiar participants became with their partner during the date, the more they realized that their initial impression based on an ambiguous dating website profile was not that accurate. The new world of internet dating, one question surrounding attraction is how tendencies regarding mate preference that have evolved over generations play out in the modern era of internet dating, speed dating events, and Facebook. The promise and pitfalls of online dating benefits uh, aggregates uh, a it aggregates a large number of profiles. Uh, it provides opportunity for communication. It matches users based on analyses of compatibility. But success rate is not higher than other old-fashioned methods. 81% provide inaccurate information in their profile for at least one characteristic. They lie about their weight. They lie about their age. And they lie about their height. Why? Because women are attracted to taller men, so men will lie about how tall they are. Women will lie about how tall they are as well, because men like women that are right in the middle. Uh, so what does that mean? Well, the average height for females in the United States is about five foot four, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, average height for men are about, is about five foot ten. So anything over five foot ten is considered good. Anything around five foot four is considered good for females. And of course, no gender differences. Deceptive misleading photos, of course. Uh, now we have the ability to filter our photographs to make them more attractive. A recent review of online dating reports that by 2005, 37% of single internet users were dating online a percentage that is almost certainly much higher today. And by 2007-2009, more new romantic relationships had begun online than through any means other than meeting through friends. Where nobody knows you're a dog on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. Well, that's kind of sad. Sternberg's triangular theory of love, uh, liking, uh, romantic love, companionate love, empty love, fatuous love, uh, infatuation, and right in the middle, consummate love. There are three components, intimacy, passion, and commitment, that are combined in various ways to form seven different types of love. And we're going to talk about them right now. Liking, intimacy alone, without passion or commitment. Uh, most friendships fit into this category. You like your friends, but you're not uh, passionate about them, and you're not really committed to them. Infatuation, passion alone without intimacy or commitment. It involves a great deal of physiological and emotional arousal, a heightened level of sexual desire, no emotional closeness, no enduring commitment. Infatuation, passion alone. So it is just a sexual relationship with no intimacy, eh, no intimacy and no commitment. Empty love, commitment alone, no passion, no intimacy. A couple who have been married for many years and have lost the passion and intimacy of their relationship. Empty love. In countries where there are arranged marriages, the early stages of marriage uh, tend to be empty. No passion, no intimacy. 
romantic love, there is passion, there is intimacy, but there is no commitment. It is joyful, it is intense, it rarely lasts for very long. Why? Because there is no commitment between either one of them. Companionate love, there is intimacy, there is commitment, and but there is no passion. Uh, this type of uh, love occurs with long-term couples. The passion has uh, decreased, but they still feel intimate toward one another. They certainly are committed to one another because they've been married for such a long time, or they've been with each other for such a long time. Fatuous love, there is passion, there is commitment, but there is no intimacy. Whirlwind courtships uh, fit this criteria. Uh, people meet, fall passionately in love, and then get married before they have a chance to really know each other. This is what happened with Romeo and Juliet. It, it's also what happened uh, during World War II. A lot of uh, men were going off to war. Uh, things weren't looking so good uh, for uh, America, for the United States. Uh, so the probability of not not returning was was fairly high. And for that reason, women felt uh, drawn to soldiers. Uh, the soldiers, of course, were afraid that uh, they would uh, they wouldn't come back. Uh, so there was a lot of uh, uh, whirlwind cor uh, uh, courtships uh, that happened during World War II. Uh, my own parents were married uh, in, during World War II, but they had uh, dated uh, from, uh, for about four years before, before my dad went off to war. They got married, they got married uh, when he was uh, at Camp Crowder in Missouri. They got married uh, when he was uh, training, and uh, about uh, three months later, he shipped out for England and uh, the uh, D-Day invasion. Consummate love, passion is there, intimacy is there, commitment is there, the ideal love for many people. And of course, this is a picture of Princess Bride. There's the princess. And I've read the book, actually. It's not quite the same as the movie, but it's pretty good. Although love is a universal emotion, how we experience it and what we expect from close relationships is linked to culture. Romantic love is viewed as more crucial in individualistic uh, cultures compared to collectivistic ones. Japanese ame. The Japanese describe ame as an extremely positive emotional state in which one is totally passive uh, is a totally passive love object, indulged and taken care of by one's romantic partner, much like a mother-infant relationship. It is sometimes described as married and divorced at the same time. Uh, ame has no equivalent word in English or in any other Western language. Uh, so that's ame. Uh, it's kind of like codependency where one, uh, one of the parties treats the other one without a lot of affection and the other one is just falls over the other the other individual the chinese concept of uh, gan king uh, differs from the western view of romantic love gan king is is achieved by helping and working for another person for example a romantic act would be fixing someone's bicycle or helping someone learn new material Ga, gan king I'm sure I'm pronouncing that incorrectly. In uh, Korea, a special kind of relationship is expressed by the concept of jun. Much more uh, than love, jun is what ties two people together. Couples in new relationships may feel strong love for each other, but they have not yet developed strong jun. That takes time and many mutual experiences. Interestingly, Jun can develop in negative relationships, too, for example, between business rivals who dislike each other. Jun may annoyingly grow between them over time, with the result that they will feel uh, that a strange connection exists between them. And that's according to Lim and Choi in 1996. Attachment styles play an important role in adult relationships. Researchers feel that once an attachment style is formed in early childhood, it will continue to function as a durable template throughout later relationships. 
Thus, a romantic partner will most likely treat their partner in the same manner that they treated their significant caregivers. An individual who was securely attached as a child had parents who were responsive and dependable. These individuals not only trust themselves, but trust others as well. They are comfortable with themselves whether they are in a relationship or not. An individual who was attached to their parents in a preoccupied or resistant manner had parents who were inconsistent in their uh, displays of love. Alcoholics tend to demonstrate this attachment style. Uh, these individuals have trouble trusting themselves and tend to be dependent on others. These individuals must be continually in a relationship and display possessiveness and jealousy. An individual who was attached to their parents in an avoidant manner had parents who were dismissive, psychologically distant, or physically unavailable. These individuals trust themselves but not others. They will seek close relationships but then react in an emotionally distant manner. These individuals are the most likely to end up in, a, in serial one-night stand encounters. An individual who was attached to their parents in a disorganized, disoriented manner had parents who were neglected, uh, neglectful or abusive. These individuals have trouble trusting themselves or others. These individuals struggle in relationships and may seek individuals similar to their parents, thus becoming the victim of domestic violence. A team of researchers recruited college students in the greater New York area who described themselves as currently being intensely in love. They asked these research participants to bring two photographs to the experimental session, one of their beloved and one of an acquaintance, acquaintance of the same age and sex as their beloved. After filling out some questionnaires, the participants were ready for the main event. They slid into a functional MRI scanner, which records increases and decreases in blood flow in the brain. These changes in blood flow indicate which parts of the brain have neural activity at any given time. While the participant was in the scanner, the experimenters alternated one photograph and then the other, interspersed interspersed with a distraction task. Prior research has found that the VTA uh, becomes highly active. VTA becomes highly active when people ingest cocaine in, uh, uh, in inducing feelings of pleasure, euphoria, restlessness, sleeplessness, and loss of appetite, reactions that are reminiscent of falling in love. The VTA, rich in neurotransmitters, dopamine, also fires when people eat chocolate. Thus, the VTA is a major reward and motivation center of the brain, and is, uh, is, as is the caudate nucleus. Functional MRI studies uh, of gamblers' brains as they gambled show greater uh, increased activity when they won. Thus, when people say they fall in love is like a drug or like winning the lottery, they're right. All of these experiences activate the same dopamine-rich centers of pleasure. Social exchange theory holds that how people feel positively or negatively about their relationships will depend on, one, their perception of, of the rewards they receive from the relationship, two, their perception of costs they incur, and three, their perception of what kind of relationship they deserve and the probability that they could have a better relationship with someone else. And the cartoon says, of course I can accept you for who you are. You are someone I need to change. <laughs> this simple notion, we're talking about social exchange theory, this simple notion that relationships operate on an economic model of costs and benefits, much like the marketplace, has been expanded by psychologists and sociologists in complex theories of social exchange. We buy the best relationships we can get, one that gives us the most value for our emotional dollar. Rewards are the positive gratifying aspects of the relationship that make it worthwhile and reinforcing, including the kinds of personal characteristics and behaviors of our relationship partner that we have already discussed, and our ability to acquire external resources by virtue of knowing this person. For example, gaining access to money, status, activities, 
or other interesting people. In Brazil, friendship is openly used as an exchange value. Brazilians will readily admit that they need a pistola, pistola, pistola uh, literally a big powerful handgun, uh, meaning that they need a person who will use their personal connections to help them get what they want. Costler, the other side of the coin, and all friendships and romantic relationships have some costs attached to them. Putting up with someone's annoying habits and characteristics is a good example. The outcome of, of the relationships, relationship is a direct comparison of its rewards and costs. You can think of it as a mathematical formula where outcome equals rewards minus costs. If you come up with a negative number, your relationship is not in good shape. Over time, you have amassed a long history of relationships with other people, and this history has led you to have certain expectations as to what your current and future relationships should be like. <laughs> Some people have a high comparison level expecting lots of rewards and few costs in their relationships. Now, who would these people be? Well, these people would be very attractive people who are used, used to getting what they want and, and, and it not costing them very much. If a given relationship doesn't match this expect, expected comparison level, they will be unhappy and unsatisfied. Let me give you a quick example. Let's say that a very attractive woman marries a very attractive man. Well, both of them have high, uh, high uh, expectations. Uh, they, they expect lots of rewards because they're used to lots of rewards. Society gives them lots of rewards. Uh, and, usually, and a lot of times the relationship isn't very happy. Why? Because they're not getting what they expect. It's costing them too much. Their relationship is costing them too much. So a lot of times you will see a very attractive woman with a, uh, a, a man that's not nearly as attractive. He's not at her level of attractiveness. Now, why in the world would she marry this guy? Well, the reason she marries this guy is because she gets a lot out of it. She gets lots of rewards, and it doesn't cost her very much. Does that make I, I hope that makes sense. If a given relationship doesn't match this expected comparison level, they will be unhappy and unsatisfied. People who have a low comparison level would be happy in the same relationship because they expect relationships to be difficult and costly. So if they have, if, if they're, so this is one of the reasons why you marry somebody, it, you create a relationship with somebody that is at about the same attractiveness level that you are. If the other person is too attractive, it costs you too much. If the other person is uh, unattractive, uh, then you can dominate over them. You can laud over them. There are a lot of people out there. Could a relationship with a different person give you a better outcome or greater rewards for fewer costs than your, your current one? People who have a high comparison level for alternatives, either because they believe the world is full of fabulous people dying to meet them, or because they know of a fabulous person dying to meet them, are more likely to get into circulation and make a new friend or find a new lover. People with a low comparison level for alternatives will be uh, more likely to stay in a costly relationship be, uh, because to them, what they have is not great, but is better than their expectation of what they could find elsewhere. Um, just today I read an article, and I don't know why I read this article. Uh, it was about um, Chris Kardashian. Uh, Chris Kardashian is the mother of all the Kardashian ladies. I guess there's one, one kid in there, one, one male. Uh, one male and four females or something. Anyway, Chris Kardashian was married to Robert Kardashian. And Robert Kardashian was this millionaire, and he was a nice guy, and he was a good father. And Chris uh, ran out on him. She, she had an affair with somebody. And they asked her why she did that. And the, her answer was, she made a mistake. She made a mistake. She should never have done that. He was a good father. He was a handsome man. He was a wealthy man. And uh, and the next guy she married was Bruce Jenner, uh, who is now Caitlyn Jenner, of course. Uh, but she married Bruce Jenner. Now, why in the world would she go from this millionaire to this celebrity who doesn't have a lot of, who doesn't have any money, doesn't have as much money? Why would she do that? Well, the answer was 
that she was she was a very attractive woman married to a very attractive and desirable man and because of that she wasn't getting the normal rewards that she was expected because she was so so uh, uh, so attractive so why did she marry Bruce Jenner well Bruce Jenner wasn't that attractive he was very famous but he wasn't that attractive and evidently he had um, he had uh, desires to be transgender, and that's something that nobody real, really realized. He seemed like this this uh, macho, uh, this extremely macho individual, and it turned out that he wasn't. So did she get more out of the second relationship than she did out of the first? And the answer is yes, she did, because, because Bruce Jenner, in order to keep her, had, had to uh, give her more rewards as it were. There you go. An example of today's world. <laughs> and she just admitted that on some television show. <laughs> like today. We know that many people do not leave their partners even when they're dissatisfied and their other alternatives look bright. Research indicates that we need to consider at least one additional factor to understand close relationships. A person's level of investment in the relationship. To predict whether people will stay in an intimate relationship, we need to know their level of satisfaction in the relationship, what they think of the alternatives, the degree of their investment in the relationship. I miss you, but probably not as much as you miss me. I'm awesome. Ta -da! Equity theory, equitable relationships are the happiest and most stable. Rewards and costs are roughly equal. In inequitable relationships, one person feels overbenefited, lots of rewards, few costs, devote little time or energy to the relationship. Underbenefited, few rewards, high costs, devote a lot of time and energy to the relationship. Inequity is more important to uh, people who uh, who is uh, a, to a person who's underbenefited. Does equity operate the same way in long term versus new relationships? Not exactly. The more we get to uh, know someone, the more reluctant we are to believe that they are simply exchanging factors, uh, favors, and, and uh, the less inclined we are to expect immediate compensation for a favor. In casual relationships, we trade in kind. You lend someone your class notes, he buys you a beer. But in intimate relationships, we trade very different resources. So determining if equity has been achieved can be difficult. Long-term intimate relationships seem to be governed by a looser give-and-take notion of equity rather than a rigid tit-for-tat strategy. According to Clark and Mills, uh, interactions between new acquaintances are governed by equity concerns and are called exchange relationships. In comparison, let me take a drink. In comparison, interactions between close friends, family members, and romantic partners are governed less by an equity norm and more by a desire to help each other in times of need. In these communal relationships, people give in response uh, to the other's needs, regardless of whether they are paid back. <clears throat> To test the exchange and communal relationship model, Rusbolt in 1983 asked college students involved in heterosexual dating relationships to fill out questionnaires for seven months. Every three weeks or so, people answered questions about each of the components of the model. Rusbolt also kept track of whether the students stayed in the relationships or broke up. People's satisfaction alternatives and investments all predicted how committed they were to the relationship and whether it lasted. The higher the number on the scale, the more each factor predicted commitment to and length of relationship. Subsequent studies have found results uh, similar to those for married couples of diverse ages, for lesbian and gay couples, for close non-sexual friendships, and for residents of both the United States and Taiwan. A further test of the model focused on couples' willingness to make personal sacrifices for their partner or for the sake of the relationship. 
and this is according to Van Lang, Van Lang uh, et al. in 1997. The researchers found that couples willing to make sacrifices for each other were strongly committed to their relationship, a commitment stemming from a high degree of satisfaction and investment in the relationship and the low quality of alternatives to the relationship. The current American divorce rate is nearly 50% of the current marriage rate and has been for the past two decades. And of course, countless romantic relationships between unmarried individuals end every day. After many years of studying what love is and how it blooms, social psychologists are now beginning to explore the end of the story, how it dies. In the break is the breakup moral. If you find yourself in a romantic relationship and your partner seems inclined to break it off, try to end it mutually. Your experience will be less traumatic because you will share some control over the process, even if you don't want it to happen. And of course, the joke says, one question, when you're through breaking up with me, can I break up with you? <laughs> Relationship dissolution is not a single event, but a process with many steps. According to Duck, it has four stages. This is 1982. Interpersonal uh, thinks about dissatisfaction. Dyadic discusses breakup with partner. Social breakup announced to others. Intrapersonal recover by thinking about why and how it happened. And the joke says it was a mutual breakup. Kevin and I both thought we were too good for each other. Another approach to studying why relationships end uh, considers what attracted, uh, attracted the people to each other in the first place. In one study, college men and women were asked to focus on a romantic relationship that had ended and to list the qualities that first attracted them to the person and the characteristics they ended up disliking the most about the person. About the person. 30% of these breakups were examples of fatal attractions. The very qualities that were initially so attractive became become the very reasons why the relationship ended. He's so unusual and different became he and I have nothing in common. She's so exciting and unpredictable became I can never count on her. This type of breakup reminds us again of the importance of similarity between partners to successful relationships. Rusbolt identified four types of behavior that occur in troubled relationships. Destructive behaviors, actively harming the relationship, abusing the partner, threatening to break up, actually leaving, passively allowing the relationship to deteriorate, refusing to deal with problems, ignoring the partner, spending less time together, putting no energy into the relationship. Constructive behaviors, actively trying to improve the relationship, discussing problems, trying to change, going to a therapist, passively remaining loyal to the relationship, waiting and hoping the situation will improve, being supportive rather than fighting, remaining optimistic. Can we predict the different ways people will feel when their relationship ends? Responsibility for the breakup is an important factor. Breakers, high level of responsibility, least painful, upsetting, stressful. Breakees, low level of responsibility, miserable, lonely, depressed, and angry. Mutuals, some level of responsibility, not as upset as breakees, but more stressed than breakers. Factors that affect experience of a breakup, gender, Women report more negative reactions than men. Do people stay friends after breakup? Heterosexual men are not interested in friendship, regardless of their role in the breakup. Women are more interested in remaining friends, especially if they are the breakee. Anyone is more interested in remaining friends if the satisfaction of and investment in the relationship are high. And that is the end of the lecture. So I hope you understand more than you understood before. It's uh, yeah, all this, we, we see all this stuff and we experience all this stuff in high school, but uh, 
it's when we get out in the real world and experience it for ourselves, that's when we know what's going on. So I'll talk to you next week. It's going to be something else fun.